this isn't always true. So not every student with specific learning difficulties will necessarily experience challenges. And we shouldn't assume that everyone who is struggling to learn another language has specific learning difficulties. And it's, 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 all, it's often a tricky task, especially in multilingual contexts, to establish what is the cause and what is the effect. Sorry, my presentation seems to be some kind of an autoplay mode, so I have to speak, try to follow its space. So, what we have done uh, is a series of studies on dyslexic language learners as part of a big project um, that was started in, in Hungary and that was actually Agnes was also uh, involved in, and that's summarized in, um, in, in one of my books. And what we did was we conducted focus group interviews with teachers in in five schools, we had interviews with 15 dyslexic learners aged between 14 and 28 who learned a variety of, of languages, English, German and Spanish. We had a questionnaire study with dyslexic and non-dyslexic learners. So this was a quite a large scale investigation. Um, and we also used like a language assessment tool with a very small sample at, at that time. So what I'm just going to summarize very briefly is based on all this work which uh, spanned about, I think, at least three years um, in, in Hungary. So what we found was relating, for example, the, the difficulties uh, of students, that is, what is they report in the questionnaire? What is it that they find difficult when they learn languages? One of these things was learning vocabulary. Uh, and this is what almost every dyslexic student would say, oh, I find memorizing words really, really challenging. Um, and the other thing that uh, they mentioned was spelling. Of course, if you look at the graph, they did experience difficulties in, in other areas as well. But for example, in listening comprehension, the difference was smaller. Um, or in speaking, maybe the difference was smaller. But here, you can see that this is what they think as it is really challenging for them, for them and it actually matched what also the, the teachers reported in terms of where they, they need more support. Um, this is the, uh, the test, so when we looked at how they actually do, so does the, what they say in a questionnaire match what they actually do uh, in a test, and yes, we found that indeed they do experience challenges in spelling, you can see the differences. Um, but they also uh, experience challenges in producing sentences in speech um, and, and, and some other areas. But spelling came out, as you can see, was still um, pretty important. Um, when we looked at vocabulary knowledge and uh, grammatical um, knowledge, on one side you can see the original study, which is 10 um, students. Um, what you can see in terms of grammar is that as grammar gets more difficult, the gap between the dyslexic and non-dyslexic students uh, widens, right? So uh, positive uh, sentences like I like this or I can do that, they were still you know, minimal differences between dyslexic and non-dyslexic students. But when it came to forming questions like do you like or what do you do or I don't like, the gap widened. And then when we go to the passive structure, some of the dyslexic students could do it. So uh, again, it shows that yeah, the more difficult grammar uh, gets, the more support the students uh, need. Uh, in the other study that we have just done recently, we used the British Council's Actis test. Uh, it's a combined um, um, grammar and, and vocabulary uh, test. What we found was, uh, and this is a larger sample, uh, the difference between dyslexic and non dyslexic students with grammar and vocabulary combined was still significant statistically, but it wasn't that big. And one of the reasons that you can see that none of the, that overall the students didn't do very well on the average test, um, and these are kind of year eight students, 14 year olds, and this is a young learner's test also. So I think that also does say something about um, primary school English language teaching in in Hungary um, that the students didn't score very well on, on this test. We went to kind of typical primary schools in, in Budapest, nothing, nothing special. We had one special one, but interestingly, in this, so, and this school was in a 
high socioeconomic area. I don't know if you know. Normally, Budarish, it's uh, it's a wealthy um, area, and the children in Budarish didn't do much better than uh, the children in the tenth district in Kobanya. And actually, we found out that in the, the school in the tenth district, we had wonderful English teachers who were trying to um, compensate for the social disadvantage. So that was also very interesting. But anyway, the students didn't do very well. So how did we address this in the engaged project? Um, we added orthographic and phonological awareness training, so that's uh, kind of uh, that's lesson one that I presented. We had uh, we added training in, in word recognition, so that stu when students see the written form, they, they recognize the, the word and its meaning and its pronunciation. We do have some explicit teaching or explanation of spelling and pronunciation regularities in the project. So just to show you, you know, some example, like look at the pictures, um, listen to the words, which sound don't you hear, right? So just practicing that, you know, they, they, they don't uh, hear the, the K uh, sound, um, uh, which is, again, not always made explicit uh, to, to, to the learners, okay? Um, you will hear and see words. If you heard the word, you can see, uh, uh, click on yes. If not, you can know. Again, this is word recognition, simple word recognition. But do you hear cat or kid? Okay? And then uh, they can click on it. And this is again uh, some kind of regularity recognition. Do you listen to the pronunciation and look at the way the following words are written? Surf, picture, Saturday, burger, turn. Kind of recognizing that these you are um, combinations are, are pronounced in the same way. So, um, and then students have to fill in the gaps with the um, with the with the, word, with, the with the letters missing. So we, we try to address these. Um, we had a multimodal presentation of word word cries always in sentences. Students could listen. So that was meant to to help the students' vocabulary learning difficulties. Um, now, we also found that students do have text comprehension challenges. And I'm going to talk briefly about two research projects um, that we had done with uh, some pedagogical amplifications. Um, one was a, a study conducted in Slovenia where we looked at how the way we present a text to the students uh, influences uh, the uh, students' text comprehension. And we had the students could read a test, text, listen to a text, or read and listen to the text at the same time, right? Multimodal presentation. And we were interested in whether, um, stu whether students with dyslexia benefit more from the multimodal presentation than those who don't have um, dyslexia. And we also looked at whether this advantage depends on the difficulty. Um, and uh, just briefly, we had it was a large scale study with lots of participants, uh, A2 level. Uh, so they, in the Hungarian system, they, they would be like uh, near five, six um, students. Um, These this were the, the texts, the students read informational texts about interesting topics, and they had to answer questions or read or listen to, and they had to answer questions, short answer questions, so write down. The, the answers uh, on an answer sheet. And it was paper-based. And we also did uh, uh, parts of the special needs assessment profile, so to assess their first language skill in Slovenian. They did a timed reading test. They had to read words, real words, and they had a phonological awareness test, so they had to manipulate um, sounds. And they had to read non-existing words in Slovenian. And, um, and also timed dictation tasks. So these are some typical tests that are used in dyslexia identification because what we were also interested in is like students who were identified officially as dyslexic, did they indeed perform worse on these tests than those who were not? In a way, we were kind of double checking the Slovenian dyslexia identification system, how successful that is and how reliable it is. Um, and this was the design, so we made sure that, that um, we followed certain research design principles so that the order of the text was uh, counterbalanced, etc. Um, then we did a similar study in Hungary, but this time we didn't look at multimodal presentation. 
but we looked at how much time students have to complete the reading. Okay? This is something that you talked about in your um, introductory speech uh, in terms of extra time available in, in exams. Uh, basically, how much time do students, extra time students need and whether actually giving extra time to this lessic student does help them. And the design was quite similar uh, with a slightly smaller number of participants and with older students, year 8 students and uh, A2 and B1 level proficiency. And this was a computer-based test, um, the ACTIS test, that's a British Council test, the British Council sponsored this research. And the students had to do, these were multiple choice questions, they did everything on screen, and then one of them was kind of ordering the, the text, the sentences, the, the sentences were, were mixed up. And we uh, used the Hungarian dyslexia test um, developed by a team of researchers um, in originally in the Hungarian Institute of Psychology, but then the company took over. And we had very similar tasks as in the uh, Slovenian study, but we didn't do the dictation task. And we also measured students' first language comprehension, and those again from Hungary, they know this competenziometer test um, in, in, in year eight, so this was the first language reading comprehension test. Um, now, what is interesting, and this is why I, would like to, I wanted to talk about, is the difference in the, in the, in the context. Now, um, in the um, Slovenian study, when we looked at the students' first language skills, that is the, the underlying first language skills that are used for identifying dyslexia, we found that yes, the, the dyslexia test in Slovenian does work, the dyslexic students indeed perform worse on all of, all of, on all of these measures, but the difference is only of a medium size. It's not very, very large by this age. Only dictation has a large effect. And actually research shows that the older the students get, these tests actually work less because there is a plateau. Students do develop in this, and with literacy instruction, the students get better. So this is basically what you would uh, expect. Um, and so in this regard, it's like, uh, the Slovenian system did quite well. Now what happened in Hungary, students are two, two years uh, older. What we expected was that the difference should be only probably medium size or even smaller than we saw in the dyslexia study. But instead, we found a large effect, like a huge difference between the first language skills of dyslexic and non-dyslexic Hungarian students. And Slovenian and Hungarian are very similar in the spelling system. So it's not the difference between the languages. And I think it's the difference in the context that I think Slovenian students do get much better support for developing their first language skills than Hungarian dyslexic students do. Okay? So what lessons um, are, are learned? I already mentioned them. Um, there are still differences which are big, uh, even at the age of 12, 12 and 14, in first language skills. And we need to count with this in our teaching. The differences are larger in Hungary than in Slovenia. And that also students had in Hungary, they had significant challenges with comprehending the competence test, the first language competence test, uh, which shows that when you assign reading texts um, to read in history, geography, etc., in the classroom in the first language, students with dyslexia will experience challenges. Um, just very briefly about the role of first language. In Slovenia, we can say that it was around uh, 21% uh, explanation in the second language competence. Uh, the rest was caused by, by other factors, such as vocabulary and so on. In the Hungarian study, uh, it's about 25% also. And we measured vocabulary and grammar knowledge in English as well, which contributed 54%, uh, okay? So that means that in order to understand how well people comprehend texts, we need to uh, also look at how much grammar and vocabulary they know in an additional language, and we need to focus on both uh, grammar and vocabulary and developing their kind of underlying first language skills. So what we did we learn? First language skills are important in predicting second language learning outcomes, but second language grammar and vocabulary knowledge are more important in explaining how students will understand text in English, 
and teachers should, language teachers should uh, pay attention to developing students' vocabulary and grammar skills because that will help them understand the, uh, the, the text better. Um, and that um, we can see the text comprehension di uh, differences in the reading um, between the students who have um, uh, reading difficulties uh, in their first language, in English as well, um, in Slovenia and, um, and in Hungary as well. Um, but when you look at, and then I think this is the more interesting chart, when we look at who are the dyslexic students among those who don't understand texts uh, very well in English, we have uh, some non-dyslexic students as well, and also a very small number of dyslexic students can actually become very good second language learners. Uh, and I think that's again important, an important uh, lesson that we shouldn't generalize uh, about dyslexic students because they can become really good readers as well. And they also, you know, many of them belong to the average reader category where most of our students fall. So uh, um, we shouldn't just uh, stereotype things. Um, in, uh, in Hungary, what we also found that uh, the students' comprehension difficulties depends on the text. So when uh, a, a te text is um, um, very long, or it, if it requires understanding how the text together, then students who have above average first language skills, they are better. In other words, students who struggle, they are worse. Okay? So uh, it does depend on the task as well. So the more difficult the reading task gets, the more challenges uh, uh, students uh, will, will have. But overall, in, when we look at the, the data, then the sentence comprehension task uh, uh, for the students was just too easy at this level, and the long text comprehension task was too difficult. So, but the long text was only like 250 words, right? So that also shows that even that in year eight, uh, non dyslexic students have um, uh, also difficulties understanding text that are 250 words long in English. So I think we still have work to do. Um, listening, you would expect that students with uh, dyslexia uh, are really good listeners, right? Because they have reading difficulties. So very often the advice is, oh, instead of reading, let them just listen. Okay, well, unfortunately it doesn't always work because as you can see, there are still many dyslexic students who struggle with listening and um, although there are also above average uh, listeners in the Slovenian um, data. Um, and what is interesting is what happens when we allow students to read and listen at the same time. And what you see on this chart is that actually this column is divided into two. So the, the, the reading, allowing students to read and listen at the same time equalizes the differences between dyslexic and non-dyslexic students. So it does help them understand uh, texts uh, better. And there was some difference for the easy and, uh, and difficult uh, texts. Actually, when the text is difficult, the dyslexic students benefit even more. So uh, we need to again take into account how difficult the task is. Um, I think I will skip this so that you can get your coffee quicker. Um, and uh, I get um, um, to the other data, which is uh, um, the, uh, the timing data. Um, what we found in the Hungarian data about test timing is that it didn't influence reading performance. Uh, we allowed students in Hungary to read um, 25% uh, longer than, um, uh, than expected, uh, and, and it didn't help dyslexic students. Uh, and the reason for that was because the test itself was already timed in a way that it gave sufficient time for everybody to do it, because we timed the students, and 95% of them actually finished with the, um, within the given time, and none of the students who exceeded the given time, when we gave them more time, actually had a specific learning difficulty. So, um, what does it, um, it show? That, um, that when we, we take, um, we, we measured how long students generally take, and then we calculated when they finished, 
And what we found that the standard time for everybody to kind of perform at the best of their level is around 35% longer um, than, than, than the, the, the average meeting time. So I think what is important here is to make sure that you give more time to everybody, not just that you give more time to dyslexic students. Uh, because um, it, it doesn't really uh, help in itself if you make the, the reading text very quick. So students who don't have dyslexia, they also struggle. Um, so overall, uh, we, we, we found that um, if you add a, a maximum of 50% to an average test completion time, it might allow every student to display the best of their abilities. So I think I, in an ideal world, we should time like 10, 20 people with varying abilities, how long they read the text and answer the questions, and then add 50%, and that should be the time for everybody, okay? Uh, and that's what uh, um, the inclusive um, um, teaching should be about, looking at offering opportunities for everyone so that we don't have to make special allowances for students who have dyslexia. So again, just to build on these uh, from uh, in our study, we always give options for comprehension so students can read and listen at the same time, and they can decide if they want to read or listen, or do both. Um, and, and we actually wanted to make sure in our engaged materials that we use differentiation in instruction and assessment, and that we use also what is called universal design, so that, um, that, uh, that the materials are accessible for everybody um, and not just those with dyslexia. And particularly, for example, the reading class where we always have listening, it's, it's suitable for students with, with visual uh, uh, difficulties and, and also maybe that they can read the transcript of this test uh, for, for students with hearing impairment. So uh, I'm just trying to finish in time. Um, thank you for your attention on behalf of the Slovenian team. So you can see a photo of Ljubljana as well. And if you want to read in more detail, you can read some of our research. Was mit allen Ligastenikerinnen und Ligastenikern Probleme mit dem Zweitspracherwerb haben und nicht jeder oder jede Schülerin und Schülerin mit, äh, Schüler und Schülerin mit Schwierigkeiten äh, hat äh, Legasthenie. Also das hängt nicht unbedingt immer zusammen. Ähm, sie hat in der Folge einige ihrer Studien, empirischen Studien vorgestellt, ähm, zum Beispiel Kormos und äh, 2017, wo sie geguckt haben, ähm, ähm, welche Probleme äh, Schülerinnen und Schüler mit Legasthenie selber angehen, dass sie diese haben. Und daraus äh, kam eigentlich, dass sie vor allem Rechtschreibschwierigkeiten erfahren und Vokabular. Also das Lernen von neuen Vokabeln ist besonders schwierig. Äh, in der Studie mit Kormos und Miko äh, äh, aus 2010 kam aber auch, äh, daraus kam hervor, dass äh, es auch große syntaktische und grammatikalische Probleme gibt. Also es ist wirklich eine sehr facettenreiche äh, oder eine, eine Menge an Facetten die äh, Schülerinnen und Schüler mit Legasthenie erfahren. Ähm, in der Folge ist sie dann äh, etwas länger eingegangen auf die unterschiedlichen Studien in Slowenien und ähm, Ungarn, äh, auch in Zusammenarbeit mit Karl Pizorn. Und äh, da ging es in erster Linie vor allem um Textverständnisschwierigkeiten. Und ähm, sie haben sich angeguckt, inwiefern äh, die Schwierigkeit eines Textes, also wie komplex ist eigentlich äh, die, ein Text selber und äh, inwiefern äh, erlaubt die Aufgabenstellung mehr Zeit. Also wie viel Zeit äh, können Schülerinnen und Schüler ähm, benutzen, um eine Aufgabe zu lösen. Äh, sie haben sich auch angeguckt, inwiefern die Erstsprache, also die Fähigkeiten in der Muttersprache eine Rolle spielen. Und was daraus hervorkam, war eigentlich, dass auch bei den 12- bis 14-Jährigen vor allem auch die Schwierigkeiten in der Muttersprache immer noch einen substanziellen Einfluss haben auf äh, die Ergebnisse in der Zweitsprache. Ähm, was interessant war, ist, dass die äh, Schülerinnen und Schüler in Ungarn äh, etwas älter waren als die Schülerinnen und Schüler in Slowenien und dass aber trotzdem die ungarischen Schüler eigentlich etwas weniger gut äh, abschnitten als ähm, die in Slowenien und ähm, Judith äh, 
oder die Interpretation, die Sie da angegeben haben, ist, dass wahrscheinlich die Unterstützung in Slowenien für Schülerinnen und Schüler mit Lernschwierigkeiten größer ist, besser und stärker ist als in Ungarn. Ähm, was auch daraus hervorkam aus diesen Studien, ist eben, dass ähm, außer die Muttersprache, dass in der Zweitsprache, dass es vor allem um Vokabular und Grammatik geht, also dass das einen starken Einfluss hat und dass es deswegen im Zweitsprachunterricht sehr wichtig ist, dass wir daran äh, arbeiten für Schülerinnen und Schüler. Ähm, eine wichtige äh, Erkenntnis aus den Studien ist, dass sie äh, Schülerinnen und Schüler die Möglichkeit gegeben haben, während sie einen Text gelesen haben, äh, das mitzuhören. Also sie haben Sprachtechnologie verwendet, um äh, die äh, Texte vorlesen zu lassen. Und das hat äh, die Ergebnisse nivelliert. Also die Schülerinnen und Schüler waren einfach besser. Also wenn sie äh, gleichzeitig einen Text hören und lesen können, führt das dazu, dass die Schülerinnen und Schüler mit Schwierigkeiten besser abschneiden. Also das ist wirklich etwas, was wir in der heutigen Zeit anwenden können. Ähm, was auch wichtig ist, es gab einige äh, Kinder, die wirklich sehr gut abschnitten, trotz Legasthenie. Also um nochmal zu bestärken, dass nicht jeder mit Legasthenie hatten Probleme im Zweitspracherwerb äh, und dass im Grunde alle Schülerinnen und Schüler davon profitieren, wenn sie mehr Zeit haben, Aufgaben zu lösen. Und ihr Vorschlag wäre eigentlich, dass wir den Durchschnitt, äh, die durch, durchschnittliche Zeit äh, messen und dann 50 Prozent dazu geben, um somit allen Schülerinnen und Schülern gerecht zu werden, damit sie Aufgaben lösen können. Das war's.